Uh, I'm Michele Calabrio, Policy Advisor at uh, the European Patients Forum, and I'll be the moderator of this, uh, this webinar wearing at the same time different hats as uh, uh, Young Forum Gastein Task Force members, but also as coordinator together with uh, uh, Dr. Masaiko Subek, European Public Health Alliance of the uh, eu for health CV Society Alliance, which uh, is uh, very much linked and uh, connected to the manifesto itself. Uh, just a couple of words on the, the alliance itself. Uh, it's, uh, it's a campaign that started in 2017 um, in reaction to the Future of Europe white paper presented by the European Commission. Uh, and it brings together a pool of European public interest civil society organizations that share a vision of a Europe uh, uh, where all people are as, as healthy as they can be throughout their lives. And uh, the common aim in this campaign, uh, which is still going on, um, is still to ensure that the EU action on health remains strong after 2020. And therefore, the European Health Union is something that, of course, uh, we will also work with um, uh, in connection to this, this manifesto. Uh, before uh, before kicking off the, uh, the the webinar, a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, please use the question and answer function uh, at the right of the screen uh, throughout the entire webinar to so submit the question to the speakers, which we will try to bring in the conversation and in the discussion uh, uh, during the panel. The link uh, to the manifesto and the page of the manifesto can be found at europeanhealthunion.eu, uh, which is also posted uh, in the session chat alongside um, other key information, including the hashtag. Uh, I would also like to invite you to follow the WebAssembly link posted again uh, in the Q&A chat, where we have two questions for you uh, about your vision for the European Health Union. The first question, it's, it's kind of an open question, and we will ask you in one word, what does the idea of a European Health Union uh, mean to you? So what's the first thing that uh, comes to mind? We're thinking about the European Health Union. The second question, uh, it's, uh, it's a multiple choice question that uh, was already asked uh, during the European Health Forum in 2020, closing plenary, where we have already discussed uh, the uh, the concept of a European Health Union and the manifesto itself. Um, and uh, the question is about what do we need to bring forward the, uh, the European Health Union? And if we can see the, the results of, uh, uh, of this question on the screen now, um, we basically, uh, we basically asked uh, about uh, exactly uh, what do we need uh, uh, to uh, to make progress towards the, the health union and as you can see uh, strengthen the health mandate with additional financial regulatory powers change the EU treaty uh, apply the current instrument more effectively uh, were the three uh, were the three main questions with three main answers uh, with uh, a, a solid preference for strengthening the health mandate with additional financial regulatory powers uh we will have this question open uh, throughout the, the the discussion and the debate uh in a way that we can uh, understand whether now since the commission has moved forward on several aspects of the future EU health strategy whether the sentiment has changed after the discussion in uh, gastein but uh, uh to begin actually the the, the content part of uh, of the webinar i would like to uh to now welcome uh, bitenis and ducatis uh, it's a key initiator of the uh, the health manifesto initiative um in its of course no introduction but uh, um he's the who special envoy for european region as well as former european commissioner for health and food safety uh, and former Lithuanian Minister of Health and member of the Lithuanian Parliament. Welcome, welcome Vitenis. I hope you can hear us. I, I will have three questions for, for you to begin with as, as one of the key initiators of, uh, of the manifesto um, on this European Health Union. The first of question and, uh, uh, is why is this initiative needed and the manifesto itself needed at this specific uh, uh, moment in time? Okay, let me once again start with Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. The Union's aim is to promote peace, its values, and the well being of its people. We all know that health described in the of WHO as 
social, mental, and physical well-being of individuals, not merely disease or infirmity. It means that when we are speaking about European Health Union, we are speaking about, about one of the most important issues about uh, 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 about uh, 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 saving lives. Europeans are demanding more pan-European action for health uh, may provide the answer. But unfortunately, until 2020, development goals as such as saving lives, promoting good health and longevity were out of the radar of big European policy. For decades, health-related rela health matters were considered by the European Union almost exclusively as business of member states or quasi-market. Only COVID pandemic has shaken Europe. And now, you know, now all are speaking about, about health. During the European Health Forum Russia in 2020, uh, the change of political sentiment was nicely described. Health has been the Cinderella of public policy making for a long time. Nobody would listen and we never got to go to the ball. Now we are the equivalent of the princess at the ball and everyone wants to dance with us. It is correct. And the manifesto is a reflection on the role health currently plays as well as call to look to the future after the pandemic will be over. A call to consider the health as a rightful partner of the European ball after a bell tower watch will strike at midnight. The fact that the term European Health Union was coined in spring 2020 and a few months later catapulted to the rank of official EU policy by the European Commission President uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union address provides some warranty that success of the Cinderella will not stop with the end of pandemic, but the path European Health Union is going to be developed is not designed yet. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot indeed. It's it's a fundamental moment uh, after this crisis uh, to to advance on the discussion on the European Health Union. And actually, I have I have a second question. Uh, I have a second question for you. So uh, we have Pardon? now this manifesto. Um, could you could you please uh, uh, quickly share with us uh, what are uh, we lost connection? Can you hear us now? Do you hear me? Yeah, we can. Can can you hear us? Yeah, can I continue? Yes, we actually wanted to 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 have from you the the key elements of uh, of the manifesto. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well. Now the key elements are you know a, a lot of key elements, but 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 if uh, we have three scenarios, scenario A, when measures to make progress in health concentrate on what can be done with existing legal, financial, and managerial instruments, uh, scenario B fine-tuning of the existing instruments of health policy in parallel to development of secondary legislation and establishment of new institutions that can co create added value for European health. And scenario C, which require to go much deeper into issues related to treaty or this one treaty. As you see, the Council of Health Ministers, it was on 2nd of December, presented strong support to the, to the development of European Health Union according to the path similar to scenario A with some elements of scenario B. This is an enormous progress in comparison to the political trajectory that prevailed just uh, one year ago and a background to hope for even a stronger evolution of European health policy in the future. future. What about a more healthier phase of on article two of treaty of on European Union. And my proposal is, please look into Article 2 of, of the Treaty on European Union. In, in this Article 2, in Part 3, we can enshrine only one sentence. It, 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 and it can change game absolutely. It shall promote universal health coverage by establishing a health union. And such Part 3 uh, is about the union shall establish an internal market. It shall work for the sustainable development of Europe based on balanced economic growth and price stability, a highly competitive social market economy aiming at full employment and social progress, a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment. It shall promote scientific and technological advance and 
my proposal to add it shall promote universal health coverage by establishing a health union. And it would be a very strong signal that we are going into the scenario C, uh, uh, keeping in mind all our, our you know, uh, um, uh, uh, proposed points in our memorandum, which uh, explains a manifesto in very detailed manner. Thank, thanks a lot. And uh, um, uh, I have actually one, uh, one, last, uh, one last question on the, on the manifesto itself as an initiative. Um, how does it fit together and complement and drive forward the current uh, uh, and recently published European Commission strategy on, uh, on a European Health Union? Uh, recently published European Commission strategy is, uh, is uh, steps forward using today's instruments and uh, first it's a, a, like first building block, but in the way of scenario A, it, 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 it can't present more strongest uh, instruments uh, because you see limits which are enshrined in Lisbon Treaty and the European Commission has no chance to overcome those limits because rule of law do not allow to, to, to go forward into deepest uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 way to build really a uh, uh, strong European Health Union. Today's instruments are like, uh, as I mentioned, they belong to scenario A. They are uh, using existing legal, financial and managerial instruments. Of course, uh, you know, using in more effective way, but it is not enough. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, indeed. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a complete picture of how uh, it does it fit with uh, with the current status of uh, of discussion at European Commission level. And um, uh, as uh, as you know, we had two questions for you at the beginning of uh, uh, of this webinar, and I would like to use the results of the uh, the word cloud to introduce uh, the panel. So we asked you, what does the idea of a European Health Union mean to you? And uh, we can see that the key, um, the key three points of it are, of course, cooperation, solidarity, efficiency, but also democracy, integration, justice, prosperity, and equality. I think this is, uh, this is a very nice way to connect to, to the panel. And uh, uh, the tennis is now joined by uh, um, are the three uh, initiators of the, uh, the European Health Union initiatives. Uh, Anik De Rote, uh, Associate Professor in Health Law uh, with a focus on EU and, uh, and Global Health. Uh, Ilona Kickbush, Founding Director of the Global Health Programme at the Graduate Institute of International uh, and Development Studies in Geneva and, uh, uh, and Marty McKeep. Professor, uh, professor of European Public Health and Medical Director at the London School of Hygiene and, and Tropical Medicine. So uh, I would actually like to uh, so welcome first of all to, to this webinar and thanks indeed for uh, for being for launching together with uh, uh, with Mr. Lucatis this initiative. Um, what uh, I would like to, to start the panel with is, uh, is a quick question reflection on, uh, on what you can see here uh, in uh, the responses to, uh, to what the European Health Union meant to you. And uh, uh, I would like maybe to, to give the floor first of all to, 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 to Martin McKee. Uh, Martin, can you just give us your, your view on, on the responses of the audience? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Um, Obviously, I think solidarity is at the heart of all of this, um, but I would add two other elements that I think are really important. People-centered, because Europe has to be about people. It has to be about the people who live in the European Union, and they need to be, to be able to identify with it. And also future-orientated, uh, because we clearly need to look beyond the current crisis and look at the sustainability, sustainability of the environment, sustainability of health and sustainability in a way that won't get us back into another situation like this, which does mean addressing the broader determinants of health, one health and so on. So people centred, future orientated. 
Thanks a lot, Martin. And uh, uh, Anik, welcome to, to you as well. And I would like to, like to ask you the same question. So um, what do you think about this one word vision about the European Health Union? So I think that w what you see is that in an emergency or after an emergency, you often see a focus on short term goals, short term objectives. And I think that's kind of what we see in the focus of the European Commission now on health threats. And even there, member states are very reluctant to give the uh, European Union more powers. And so you really see sort of um, uh, the ambition already being be on a European cooperation and coordination of, of, uh, of uh, health and, and health equality, health equity, et cetera, to be already kind of um, uh, watered down a little bit. And I think that's a shame. I think that uh, I think that if if we are to really um, move forward on a European health union, the proposal by the Commission right now is too narrow and it's too emer it's too much like emergency politics and it's too much like what we've seen before. And particularly also the responses by the member states are too limited. So if we are really wanting to do something new and something that can add to what is already there on, on health system, et, et cetera, at the member state level, we need to have a, a longer view. And this is kind of in, in the same line of what Martin was saying. We need to really think about how can we address health inequalities in Europe across member states and how can we build and secure strong healthcare systems, universal healthcare, et cetera. And that's why we have this manifesto because the manifesto gives um, a sort of a voice and we also really want national parliamentarians to start asking questions to their national leaders. What are you what what are your objectives for uh, European cooperation on health and uh, wh what can e the EU do in terms of an added benefit? And right now it's still very much a European Union party, right? And this should be a, a conversation in the national parliaments. And this should be something that national uh, uh, leaders, uh, executives, are held to account. What 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 have you done for European health, and how have you really strengthened uh, European the European Health Union for the future? Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks a lot indeed. In the qualities you mentioned, it's it's already another important word that should be uh, up there together with uh, cooperation, solidarity, and and so on. And I would like now go to to Ilona before we we, we end up uh, this first round of questions for the panel. Uh, Ilona, uh, um, probably you cannot see the the answer since you're connecting via email, but um, could you just give us a one word comment on what uh, uh, the uh, the European Health Union would mean for, in your opinion? Good morning. In my opinion, we have to see that the European Health Union must have a strong global dimension. Health is global. And uh, so therefore, the European Health Union must not only work towards the inside, it's got to be a responsible global health actor and it's got to show global responsibility. So what we would see is as we strengthen the internal competencies of the European Health Union, uh, those will reflect and partly will be the basis for the strong global action. If you take the issue, for example, you were speaking about chronic diseases. If you take the issue of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the European Commission was able to sign it and play a very important role in negotiating it because it had the competencies to do so. So uh, as we look at the European Health Union and say, you know, what are these competencies that we would like also the Commission to have in order to be a very strong public health and global health actor, then uh, those kinds of issues emerge and they are already emerging again. You know that uh, the Commission has suggested a global pandemic treaty and uh, the proposal for such a treaty again would relate back to the competencies uh, that uh, the Commission has and those uh, competencies that the countries, the members are willing to harmonize, to pool, to share or even to legislate. But let me add uh, one other uh, component, and that is 
uh, that, of course, uh, if we speak of a European health union and then its global impact and responsibilities, I can see here, you know, cooperation, solidarity, prosperity. Then, of course, we have to remember that all members of the European Union and the Union itself have committed to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And that means global solidarity. And that means global solidarity also in other policy arenas. So we must not forget that a major component of uh, uh, better global health and European health would be related to the European Green Deal. It would be related uh, to the way uh, Europe approaches trade policies. It would be related to food safety and chemical safety agreements. The list is very long. And so I would say as important as it is, is to see uh, the various uh, uh, pure, let me call it that, health dimensions uh, of uh, a European health union. What Martin said earlier, the impact of the European Union on health determinants, uh, both within the union, equity was mentioned, and uh, beyond the union uh, is absolutely critical. Thanks, thanks a lot, Ilona. And uh, um, I would like actually to go back to to, to the tennis for last comment. Uh, again, we've seen the, the key question. Could you just add, uh, um, if you want, like one word, what does in one word the European Union would mean for you? Uh, for me, it means uh, universal health coverage for all. And if you are speaking about the European way of life, we need to speak at, at, about European uh, treatment of patients, equal treatment of patients of all Europeans. It means that we are treating all Europeans in the same way. Equality, solidarity, and uh, access to, 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 uh, to treatment. It uh, 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 doesn't matter do you stay in the richest country or the poorest country within the EU. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And actually, I would like to to, to stay with you, uh, Vitenis, for for a second for a second round of question. Um, if if the European Health Union existed when you were health commissioners, how would that have changed uh, your role? Um, what would have changed in uh, what you managed to achieve already as as health commissioner? Uh, you know, if if we will go into way to uh, to develop much stronger legal framework, it means that then we can see uh, 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 possibilities to to have some shared competences of the European Commission speaking about public health issues and speaking about. Um, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, aspects of treatment like in areas of rare disease or rare cancer. It means that you, you, we need to see a very active role of European Commission as active actor influencing uh, health policies in in whole European Union and of course also sharing uh, competences between member states and European Commission in more clear way. It will be really much stronger uh, uh, message to all of us to, to know that uh, that we can uh, uh, guarantee a, a better uh, quality of life implementing all instruments uh, uh, doesn't matter is SDGs or Green Deal or something but health will be in the center of, uh, of, of all issues. Health-centered approach is needed now in all policies, doesn't matter it's about economy, about financial issues, or, or, or about transport. Health policies should be implemented and commission role must be strengthened if we can go into area to have in our hands European health.
Thanks, thanks indeed. The concept of uh, health, you know, policies, it's uh, it's indeed something that should be also go together with the with the health union. And um, I will try now to actually look at the the questions that are coming from the audience. And thanks already for sharing uh, uh, for sharing some very interesting points. Uh, um, I uh, I would like to ask uh, this question to to Martin uh, from the audience. Uh, um, we've been asked about who will be the key bearer of the new uh, health policy of the European Health Union will be scientists, medical experts, politicians, citizens. How, in your view, like uh, the, the different stakeholders will will play? Well, the European Union is a political organisation, so it has to be political. Uh, it has to be the politicians, uh, and uh, so that really goes back to the Council of Ministers fundamentally, as they represent the member states. I don't see any alternative. Um, scientists advise and politicians decide. Thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, indeed, the, the political will, the political action is, is fundamental to drive this forward. And another question um, is, uh, this may be for, for, for Ilona, uh, what will be the role of uh, uh, the, the European part of the WHO in the light of the new health policy? Therefore, how do you basically envisage the, uh, the the cooperation between the European Union and the WHO in light of uh, uh, the European Health Union concept and uh, and um, and policies? Well, I think we'll see uh, a much closer interface between the European Union uh, and its various dimensions, I would say, uh, and uh, and the WHO. We have already seen that. Uh, uh, one thing we have seen clearly is that particularly the uh, political interface of the European Union with the WHO Global with the headquarters has uh, become much more intense and will intensify also through cooperations in the G20. Uh, this proposal of a treaty, uh, the cooperation in COVAX and vaccine distribution and of course, you know, we mustn't forget that the European Union is the largest development donor and uh, therefore plays a, a strong role also on, on the financial side. I think there will be much more technical cooperation also, and that is where the, the close link with the European office of the WHO obviously comes in. And uh, we will see if the ECDC gets a stronger role, the cooperation between European medical, medical agencies and, of course, particularly European science. But uh, we always say good global health begins at home. And uh, therefore, if uh, one uh, gets the European solidarity going, then the important thing will be to translate that to the global level and to ensure that there is very strong support for uh, international agreements, for the World Health Organization. And of course, again, we're talking health in all policies, the European positions in other organizations. We are just uh, having a very serious discussion at the World Trade Organization about the waiver of IP rules uh, in relation to vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics brought forward by India and South Africa. And at present, the European Union and its member states, plus more or less all the rest of the developed world, is uh, standing against this waiver. So I think there will be a lot of issues to take up and, uh, and move forward. Thanks, Thank, thanks, Lona. And uh, um, uh, still looking at the question from from the audience, I would like now go to to Anik. Um, um, we are, of course, also looking at the European Commission initiative on the European Health Union, and we discuss how the manifesto could integrate uh, uh, and and bring further um, uh, let's say completion to 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 that initiative. Um, just trying to put together a couple of questions here. So how, uh, wh what uh, would make a real impact in the, the European Health Union uh, uh, proposal by the Commission? And uh, uh, basically, uh, what should we integrate in the plan to make sure that we have this real impact, of course, considering the current uh, uh, European Union cooperation and, uh, and difference in terms of health systems? Yeah. 
So, of course, you know, the Commission has also come forward with a proposal on a European Health Union, and then there's the manifesto on a European Health Union. And so, of course, the question is, what actually is a European Health Union? And basically what the manifesto says, it's more than what the Commission has proposed. Because what the Commission has proposed is, is of course, based on what they think is politically uh, feasible. Uh, what some, it's a proposal that takes into consideration what they think member states would uh, find acceptable. And so uh, what we're basically saying is we want more than that because indeed the, the Commission's proposal on the European Health Union focuses very much on health threats when really we know what we need is strong healthcare systems to be able to, to really be resilient and ready for a next time something like this happens. But also health is more than just infectious disease control, right? I mean, uh, there's still what we see particularly now is that COVID is, for instance, especially uh, affecting, uh, you know, uh, underserved neighborhoods, people with, with uh, uh, you know, uh, obesity and all kinds of other public health uh, issues that would really uh, benefit from, uh, from, from better health altogether. And so what we need, and this goes to the question that was asked also in the Q&A, is more capacity at EU level. What you also see in the proposals by the Commission is that, uh, and also the response by the Member States, is that uh, uh, that the EU, of course, still needs to prove itself. You know, member states feel like we've proven ourselves. We we have healthcare systems for a long time, and now we have the European Union coming in. And who's to say that they can do this better than we can? Or who's to say that there will be better outcomes if we do certain things together? So every time that something like this happens, where there's a clear need for European coordination and cooperation, the EU needs to prove itself. But every time it happens, it doesn't really have the capacity to prove itself. So you're in a catch-22 where, uh, of course, what we need now from the European Health Union is more capacity at EU level, more people involved, uh, more, um, more money, basically, uh, uh, so that there can be a little bit of redistribution to areas that are underserved beyond uh, you know, uh, the common, pr the, the public procurement of medicines, but that you can actually invest in, in uh, particular areas where, where, where inequalities are, are, are really dire. So, uh, so, so that would be broadening it. And some of the proposals that we put in the manifesto really speak to that. Uh, but a lot of these proposals won't, won't be able to happen without more capacity and without more political will on the part of the member states to invest in capacity for a European health union that goes beyond, you know, dealing with health threats and dealing with large uh, uh, outbreaks. Thanks, thanks. And uh, um, I'll, I'll come back to you with, with another question that I just saw from, from, from the Q&A. Um, I have now one for, uh, for Martin as well. If you want to comment on what uh, uh, could make an additional impact in the European Health Union plan and uh, also link to a comment that we also receive on the chat, uh, how uh, chronic diseases are, uh, are maybe still missing from, uh, uh, from this European Health Union concept. Uh, if you want to have a couple of words on that. Well, chronic diseases aren't missing. Every disease is there. Uh, I mean, I, I don't quite understand that. So uh, maybe I need some more explanation because we don't differentiate or privilege one set of diseases over another. Uh, we look at the, the totality of um, the burden of disease. Uh, but I think if we get into a system of listing one disease after another, somebody will always say, well, you've left one out or whatever. I mean, that's... I think un unhelpful. Um, so, you know, I think uh, Anika has really put it very well. I mean, I think um, we, uh, this is taking Europe to the next level. It's what people are looking for. They're looking for um, a Europe that supports them at a time of need. And, uh, you know, we have to be honest, it hasn't done as well as it should have done during the pandemic. There have been a number of let's not say failures, but let's say weaknesses. Certainly we haven't got procurement right. We haven't got data right. We still don't have good timely data from each member state in at all cause mortality, for example. Uh, we have from about 17 of them, but not from the rest. Um, we haven't had a proper European research response. I mean, it is simply unacceptable that, in, that every patient with COVID did not get the opportunity to be entered into a clinical trial 
Uh, that should have happened from the very beginning. Now, that, and I'm often a very heavy critic of the UK, and, and its response has been lamentable, but that's an area where it has actually done very well. Uh, so, you know, we need to get credit for that. There have been some good examples, like sharing of the burden of patients across borders, and Germany needs to be congratulated for that. Uh, but um, we really need to do things a lot better, even in that area, leaving aside all the other things that we need to do, if we're really going to connect with the people of Europe. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Indeed, the needs and connection with people of Europe will be fundamental in making this not only like a reality, but also accepted and, and, and well, clear to, to, to Europeans. Um, Bitenis, I would like to go to you with a question that uh, uh, we have received uh, as well in the Q&A. Uh, how can we promote, make the European Health Union a reality without a much deeper and wider political integration of the EU, given the differences between health systems? Yeah, you know, uh, it is very uh, uh, clear uh, picture. We have uh, now uh, you know, uh, competences at member states level. And member states uh, are very different speaking about their health care and care systems. But it is not a barrier to see deepest convergence between them and deepest possibilities to harmonize many, many issues, speaking about access to treatment, speaking about universal health coverage, speaking about the people-centered approach. And of course, also we need to understand that now it's time to see how can we bring more um, powers to the European Commission to be active actor uh, in, in the, those fields, not only uh, following uh, member states' requests, as now is enshrined in this one city, but also being active promoter to move forward, uh, helping member states to understand what they can do and what they can't do. For example, in the area of rare disease, no one country can treat people because it's lack of knowledge, lack of capacity, lack of specialists, lack of clinical experience. And only joining forces like in European reference networks, building European reference centers, building cap capacities as, as centers, and uniting all those centers with IT tools, platforms, and so on, and building possibilities to, to connect all, you know, uh, countries together and help people to achieve uh, the treatment, doesn't matter where they are living, in which country. And it, it means we need to understand now the word cooperation, collaboration, coordination, but also enforcement of, of, of our capacities. It requires also competences at the Commission level, at the European Union level. European Parliament should be involved into, into political debate. European Council should be much more active. Can you imagine that Ministers of Health now are gathering only one time per half a year? They have only one uh, formal council and one informal council. It's absolutely a lack of, 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 of uh, you know, the political will to cooperate. That means that we need to, 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 to change such, you know, um, uh, situation. But I know that we have limits which are enshrined in this Bond Treaty. We need to understand that today political issue is how can we raise debate at national parliament level, European parliament level, and of course um, uh, 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 do what we can to, 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 to keep highly high on the political uh, agenda issue of European Thank, Thanks a lot. And actually, this is, is quite well connected to, to, to the last question that I would like to have uh, for Martin, because I know that, that you need to leave a little bit earlier, and then to Anik as well. Uh, Martin, uh, how can we strike the balance between uh, regulating the internal health market, given that health cannot be left to market, as uh, would only widen existing inequalities. Someone from the audience is asking us about this. And uh, uh, and then uh, for, for Anik, if you can follow up after Martin responds, um, uh, 
what is realistic to expect in terms of modification of uh, uh, of European Union frameworks in terms of uh, uh, treaties, uh, what we can expect, uh, what is realistic to expect uh, in, in the future to make this uh, health union a reality also from uh, the, the legal point of view, let's say. Martin? Well, there's always been a tension between the operation of the internal market and the promotion of health. Although, in fact, the court has fairly consistently come down in favour of health when it comes to decisions. And this goes back to, you know, Cole and Decker and all of the cases in cross-border care, in that it has said that the maintenance and the security of national health systems and infrastructure and so on are um, prioritised. So it, it allowed people to move across borders for spectacles and dentures and things like that. But it was much more, um, it recognised the, the need to support health. I think what we have now seen is that until now, member states felt that by sheltering their health systems within a national boundary, they were able to protect us in some way. Uh, I think they can be, they should be reasonable. Well, I would hope they can be reassured that, that that's now less of a concern and the advantages of greater cooperation are much greater, uh, particularly, I mean, the pandemic has really brought this to the fore, but this is going far beyond that in terms of collaboration for lots of reasons that we set out in the manifesto. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, some of the fears in the past have been perhaps misplaced um, and, and sometimes talked up by people for political reasons as well, actually. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's not particularly helpful. There now is a commitment to move forward. Thanks a lot, Martin, and I know that you had to leave a little bit earlier, so thanks again for, for joining this, this discussion. Um, and Nick, with, with the question that I mentioned before, so what can we expect from, from the legal point of view, if any, and eventually time framework that you might expect for this, if any? So what you see, and I think this is very interesting, is that after swine flu, there was quite a long time that the, the there was a... Um, an evaluation of the EU response and that took a long time and after this evaluation there was a proposal for the current decision, the health threats decision that uh, has been really uh, uh, central in, uh, in the COVID response. Uh, now what you see is the current Commission's proposal comes actually before there was any you know deep evaluation. This is also something that the member states have criticized. Of course, this has everything to do with, you know, um, uh, using the the emergency, the window of opportunity that is created by an emergency to create new law, which what we see after emergencies, it's much easier to create, come up with new proposals and have uh, political commitments for new proposals. But member states here uh, are really responding to the to the uh, commission's proposal saying, you know, maybe we should actually first do an evaluation of what everything that went down before we can uh, commit to new uh, uh, legislative proposals. Now, I think that I, I think when we see what happened in swine flu, it's probably smart that the Commission is doing this, but also it, it of course asks for a little bit of criticism because how can you come up with new proposals if you haven't thoroughly evaluated the current response? But so what I there's just the, so what I see is that there's a little bit that definitely the commission now is a, a lot faster and wants to uh, how do you say um, uh, strike the iron while it's hot. Um, um, but uh, I think that the member states are giving a little bit of pushback on that. There was a question also in the Q and A about why is it now a regulation and and what difference does that make with the current decision, the health threats decision? Uh, this is particularly on the coordination of a health emergency, and I think that a regulation, of course, what is important about a regulation is that it doesn't need to be translated into national law. So once it is approved, it is immediately applicable in all the member states' uh, healthcare systems. So this is, I think. Um, uh, it just creates a stronger, it does create a stronger legislative basis and a stronger legal basis for EU coordination. Th thanks a lot, Anik. And uh, as, as we're coming to the end of the uh, of the discussion, uh, I would like to 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 ask to, to the colleagues from Gastein if uh, we can have the results of the second question that we asked at the beginning 
of uh, uh, the debate uh, to see actually if there is a little bit of a difference between what uh, we're doing this and what was asked uh, uh, and uh, in 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 gosh time so um actually i think that the results more or less are are, are, are similar uh, we can still see that in order to make progress towards a health union uh, the first dominating choice is that we need to strengthen the health mandate uh, with additional financial regulatory powers uh, um, uh, with 75% that we also see that there's a 20% that thinks that we need to change the EU treaty as any other option alone would not suffice. I think these two answers are actually quite complementary because uh, probably what we need to do is start now with what we have and reinforce the current frameworks, but also not forget about looking forward and thinking about what could be done in the future, while of course actually also applying the current instrument more effectively. So. Um, uh, again, coming to the end of this uh, uh, this webinar, conscious of time, I would like to actually ask uh, uh, to all the three speakers that uh, we still have uh, uh, in the room, and thanks again to the audience for 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 all the questions. Um, so uh, I would like to just ask a quick tweet-like comment, so a very final word, also considering what we saw in the question, what we discussed in the panel. Um, to close uh, so, some final takeaway messages on, on the EU Health Union. I will start with uh, Ilona. Yes, I will reiterate again that a European Health Union can not only be inward looking, it must fulfill its global solidarity responsibilities, and it must also be aware of the strong penetrating power it actually has when it sets standards for within the European Union because of its strong influence on trade it actually starts setting global standards and that means there lies a very strong responsibility on the shoulder of the union and also in areas that we don't see as health areas yet like digital health and i think the union can actually help move some of these things forward in a responsible global way Thank, thanks a lot um Vitanis, what's your final takeaway from the discussion in the European Health Union debate? My final takeaway is simple. Let's be more ambitious. My proposal is to, in, to, to put only one additional sentence into article number two of the Treaty on European Union. And that sentence is, it shall promote universal health coverage by establishing a health union and it is crystal clear we need to go in this direction uh, speaking about equal treatment of all people and of course equal access and and uh, you know uh, 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 equal you know and, uh, capacities to to, to have the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, access to to to, to uh, 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 healthiest life, uh, quality of life. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, Vitenius, indeed. And Anik, one final sentence from you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we need European solidarity. So, uh, and for that, we need the national leaders. We need the member states. The European Union is nothing without the member states. And so I would really uh, want to ask all the people that are here in this uh, in this really great webinar, and thank you also to the Gastein Forum for, for organizing this, you know, send letters to your national uh, parliamentary members, really try and or send the manifesto to uh, national parliamentary members and ask them to ask the government, what are you doing about this? What can we do to be more solidary on health in Europe? Because we need each other. The world is a global place, like Ilona says, and the EU is a, a central actor in that. So please sign the manifesto, send the manifesto to your representatives in your national parliaments, and let's get this thing going. Thanks a lot, Anik. Uh, indeed, uh, we have discussed about a lot of keywords and that are connected to the European Health Union. We have uh, equality, access, solidarity, um, health in all policies, uh, but also the, the, the global dimension of the European Health Union and how it can also improve the way that the European Union will concretely collaborate with, uh, uh, with WHO research, the political willingness that is needed. 
Um, in closing this uh, this webinar, I would just like to to uh, to point out that indeed you can learn more and sign the manifesto visiting EuropeanHealthUnion.eu. Uh, you should see you should be able to see a slide on your screen now. Uh, and if your organization, uh, as an individual, but also if your organization, network, initiatives is interested in supporting the manifesto, please do also get in touch via uh, the, the emails that you can see here and that will be also included in the website. Um, we're coming to an end, so I would like just to ask everyone for, for the participation. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is just the first of a series of webinars that we'll try to look a little bit more into detail uh, in the different aspect of, uh, of the manifesto. So for the time being, just stay tuned on the uh, on the Gashta Inform channels uh, for more information about this. Uh, visit the manifesto website. And uh, uh, thanks again, everyone, for, for tuning in and for uh, having this great discussion about the future of health in the EU. Thanks a lot.